Hello, you wonderful people. Today I got a little bit of a tuber for you in terms of the new set and just playing it as a reset us and have us reclimb. I don't know why they do a really hard reset where they make um, really high elo people play in low elo because all that means is that the new players that are coming into the game who never got to play before or are just excited about the new set get ground pounded by the people who have been playing the game forever but is what it is i don't get paid the big bucks over at that company um but yeah we're just gonna get into it today i'm gonna buy all the units in the shop whenever we have enough gold to do so and we're just gonna be buying pairs off the start here so we're looking what looking a little towards a story weaver opener i was thinking and you just kind of want to play what the game gives you guys and be flexible. That would be my best advice to you. Play efficiently, make gold interest where you can, and just play whatever the game gives you. So, my good rule of thumb for you guys when you're choosing augments. I used to go over the augments individually, but especially for this set, you want to play whatever the game gives you in terms of an econ augment on 2-1. And you want to focus on combat augments later into the game, right? We got a little bit of a uh, ghost opener, whatever it's called, yeah, ghostly. And here's my ignorance, guys. Um, having not played this set before, I didn't know that Cho'Gath's ability already applies a bleed or a burn. I just am so used to autopiloting through the past couple sets to where um, Sunfire is always just a good early game item. Provides anti-heal, damage, tankiness, and just a lot of good good. Um, and at this point, I was holding on to the Sivers due to if you want to play Bard Reroll with Tom Kench, you kind of need her for Ricochet and it's a pain to refine her. But there's no harm or foul holding on to her this early in the game because uh, you won't be able to make gold interest anyways, right? I think having an extra Caitlyn out there with Ghostly is good. I don't think we're going to find a Kog'Maw. Kog'Maw is a really contested unit for this set. And we'll sell a sever here to make gold interest just for the Shen pair. The Shen's really good. One thing to note is we do have a remover. So even if we end up hitting like a Shen 3 or something, we can always just uh, remove the items and slide them over to Shen, right? With the tank items, that is. Darius, is, I guess, is an early game stage 2 powerhouse. Taking lunch money unconsensually. I think snagging a free upgrade with a tank component here would always be good on the carousel. Um, and at this point, your boy, you know, I'm doing a little bit of tabbing out, changing music. Sorry about this, guys. Not, not the most primo editing in the world for you here today. But it was just me and my stream, it just me by myself, so I didn't feel too bad about it at the time, but this game was just too good not to upload it, right? Alright. We're back to doing the doing the damn thing. Now, I don't really know how Ghost Sleep works all that well, but I think having the second Caitlyn out on the board is just better than having any other unit out on the board besides a sniper here. And then we got Time Kench over here where you stand on the little puddles and you gain fishes, right? Meaning you gain more and more treasure. So this was like a high econ augment, I guess. Or a high econ lobby. Now, if you guys are like powerhouse winning, like you guys are already nine streaking here and you don't really want more resources, I actually think there's a world where um, you don't stand on the puddles and you just low roll everybody else so you can keep winning. We choose this item over the um, diamond hands because it offers armor and magic resist. Now I really don't have to worry about finding magic resist for whichever unit's going to have that on it. Also, the game gives gold. And in a game now where the games are incredibly long, where you're able to go to level 10, I think having more money is just better, right? Because going high and wide is always a viable strategy to win. Especially in low elo where people's fundamentals suck. Um, you're going to see that a lot with me climbing here. It's going to look like I'm not doing anything fancy. Because more often than not, I'm not. Like, it, I started in bronze. I won. My games just started flying through the elos. It gives you like 200 LP a win. And then our 300 or 400, whatever it is. And you know, a lot of the times you can just do this just by keeping good fundamentals here. 
buying and holding pairs here, standard leveling. Redemption's really good because it keeps healing the Cho'Gath while the um, Mogul male gets to stack up the armor and magic resist. And then as he heals up at the higher percentages armor and magic resist, he gains more out of his health, right? Just something to note. Now, if you removed it from the Cho'Gath and put on the Shen here, I wouldn't blame you. Um, but I don't know. I think it's nitpicky, especially when we want to keep our upgraded Caitlyn. And looking at these choices here, if you chose the target dummy, I wouldn't blame you. But I feel like Heavenly Crest as a plus one is just goaded right now. Um, it just gives too much stats to your whole board just not to take, right? And I was debating here if um, getting out the four behemoth is better. But I'm not going to not put Kane out on the board, right? I know it seems inty. It'd be down a huge trade upgrade this whole stage, but I don't know. Kane's a unit. He At least if I lose my combats, he's going to kill a large percentage of the board, especially early in the game where people are lacking DPS. As you can see, he's just Beyblading on people. Holding the one um, Caitlyn in case we can't find a replacement. Because eventually we're going to want to bounce these items off of her. And I would like to use that remover on the Cho'Gath for like Orin. Or putting those items on a better tank than uh, a two star ones cost, right? The other thing to notice is that the vast majority of our boards upgraded. There's no need to roll. So all we're going to be doing is keeping our um, Econ high here and just pumping levels where we can, right? Now you got to assume whatever items we have on the Caitlyn here are going to go on the Morgana. So we got to think, let's go with the Negatron Cloak. We already have a lot of uh, tank items, and that would be the Negatron Cloak with the tier item that gives mana. I'm assuming Morgana has really low mana cost as is, or no, really high mana cost, so having something that just funnels her um, mana is just good. And in the early game like this right now, if you can get Caitlyn to keep casting, her um, line shot or whatever the hell it's going to be called um, does a lot of damage as is. And at power level here on 3-5, that's the interval to go fast 7. And a lot, because I just gained too much. I gained Arcanist, I gained Ghostly 4. It's just a lot to put out onto the board, right? And it also ensures that I keep my streak here. Now this is really tough. More often than that, I would have went with Jewel Lotus 3. I think that would have been my best bet to secure a top 4. But the way I look at it here is I really want to get an item for Kane. I wish I would have known the Masterworks better. I know I know the Sunfire Masterwork is really broken because it actually just does a ton of damage. We grab the Chain Vest here because we can always make Edge of Night for Kane or we can make Titans for Kane. There's just a lot of good items you can make out of Chain Vest here. The worst comes to worst, we hit it with that Reforger. And then when I was starting to read uh, Unit's descriptions a bit more, I realized that Shen is like an AoE frontliner, so you have to have a unit on the left and right hand side of him. That way when he pops the bubble, it protects the other units a bit more. I didn't know that, but... It's learning pains as we go throughout the set. I'll be sharing my knowledge with you guys. I haven't really read all the uh, units' descriptions quite yet. And at this point, after I hit the warm logs, <clears throat> kind of want to transfer all the items over to Shen. Getting the four behemoth here is really big, but we know that we we're going to go fast 10 this game because we have so much money. Also, even if we lose, the behemoth buys so much time, it allows us to farm up gold with our gold mancer. One gold don't seem like a lot, but throughout the course of the combats, if you know, we farm it up quite a few. It also makes our Cho'Gath tanky enough to be able to actually get the uh, cash out on the moguls. At this point, I wasn't sure if I was going 6 Ghostly, 
I wasn't sure what my end board was. I do know Morgana is going out onto my board, though, right? At a certain point, though, here, we want to roll down because we need to stabilize with uh, Kang 2, Morgana 2. Especially, you're going to start seeing all these people are chilling on lower intervals and rolling. Are going to finally start hitting or at least getting to the point where that they're going to start hitting for a lot. And I'm not trying to get hit for... Um, 20 damage per combat and then this whole lead I have is just out the window, right? Looking for any item that'd be good for Kane, because we kind of already have all the items that we could want for Morgana. Um, Gunblade is always flexible, so we could just slide that between whichever units we want, right? The other thing about power leveling here that a lot of people don't think about, when we do lose Goldmancer value, we lose the attack speed. The other thing is now our natural shops are just at a higher um, tier. So each time we uh, roll our shop, we have a higher chance of hitting the uh, Kane, the Alawi, the Morgana, even though we're just chilling and we won't take huge losses here. Like that was a 13 HP loss, even though I have uh, two units up on this guy. And we really want one Morgana here. At this point, I kind of decided we're not going six ghostly anymore because we technically already have the uh, we already have the best board we could possibly have. Like, there's just no way I'm fitting um, Aatrox onto this board, right? And now we just kind of hard stabilize. All that's left to do is go uh, level ten. Or we get to make a big boy decision to start stacking up gold for our gold master to make um and we we got we got breathing room here. We can let our gold master start uh giving us gold and gain the attack speed. And I don't think we're gonna take any major losses. I'm assuming with this big of a HP lead, we already top forward. So we can just sell a lot of this. <clears throat> and then we can just start chilling on um airs or here we go. So I have the um what is it? You, I have five one you guys are left over with uh, a random component, so since you want to have two full items on your carries, you're kind of stuck with just having Morgana here with just two items for right now. But we got to make a decision with uh, going level 10, we can get, we're able to get Dryad and Reaper out onto our board, which is really important for Kane. Or, since we have such a big HP lead here, we got to see where we're at gold-wise and what the shop naturally gives us. But we have a chance to finally either go level 10 for Legendaries, 10 for Kindred, or we get to chill and roll for a 3 star 4 cost. Now, knowing that nobody really touches Kane or Morgana unless uh, they're rolling for it, I'm more inclined to kind of go for a 3 star 4 cost here, but you guys have to be able to make this conscious decision in your game while you're playing, right? Especially when you have a lead like this. You know, it's really easy just to autopilot and railroad yourself into playing a certain kind of way. But these are the this right here is the break point where you have to decide Am I going for a 3 star 4 cost? Am I going for level 10? What is my win con for the game, right? That's what you have to start asking yourself. The other thing I would start telling you is um, when you're rolling for a 3 star 4 cost, you gotta start holding on to other 4 costs. And you kind of want to start doing this before half your lobby's dead. Because these other people that are like still alive and playing that are holding Orins, Nautiluses, you know, all these other shit are four costs out onto the board. Um, they're increasing your odds because there's a finite amount of units in the game for you to actually hit your two star four cost. You don't want to wait until it's just you and one other dude in the lobby and then, um, you know, nothing's out of the pool. So you're just hitting 22 ashes in a row or, you know, a ton of Nautiluses. The flip side of the coin of that is the guy can hold your Morganas too as well. So we need another item for Morgana. This is just another AP backline item that'll allow her to cast more often. And at this point, ooh, we're at six morgues. We're bussing. So this kind of, you know, instilled it into me that we're going for it at this point. And we're at 70% HP, guys. We can chill. 
you know, we can gain more value out of the gold mancer. She has higher attack speed, more gold. So we were able to farm a bit more here. So we're chilling. We don't want to kind of roll here. I wasn't scouting the best, but you want you want a few people alive, but you don't want the whole damn lobby alive that can hold your Morganas here. So holding off a little bit and just start naturally rolling. Um, with the bonus gold you get at 50 plus is really important. So we would just be rolling for Nautilus, Orin, Morgana, and Kane here and holding on to all of them. Because at this point, even though we're leaning towards a lot more Morganas, there's instances where you might just roll like 12 Orins in a row. So that's just something to keep on the mental, guys. Here we hit the Kane, And at 6-1, guys, you remember how we had the treasury? So we have quite a bit of gold now. And if you want my opinion, don't even hold on to 5 costs here. You're going to make yourself dizzy and clutter out your board. If you want to use Team Planner, I don't blame you guys um, for your roll downs here. But, you know, heaven forbid you sell something on your board off of your bench that you shouldn't have sold. You'll, you'll never forgive yourself, especially if you're one off. See, so I'm one off the Morgana here. And before I let these other like little boomers notice what I'm doing, I just got to roll down my gold and see if I can try to hit her. We ended up hitting her. Woohoo. Dude, what a baddie, bro. At this point, we're rolling for Kane 3, um, especially now since we're one off. already have enough damage at this point in the game now this guy has a ton of legendaries guys and this game that i that uh it really comes down to positioning at the end here because he has two two star five costs or he has like quite a few now he's like on four or five upgrade to five costs so you're going to see that this really came down to positioning <clears throat> i was thinking have a morgan on the left side you know she would snipe the azir and kill him but all that ended up happening was uh Udyr gave her the hands, unconsensually. And then I realized that maybe it's just a positioning differential, so last minute here, you're going to see me put the gargoyles up front, so Orin gains more armor and magic resist, um, especially with this, because more things are going to be ta uh, attacking them. And then we're going to move over last minute our Morgana, and then um, just if we didn't lose here, uh, we would just be fishing for the cane, or we'd be selling the cane to get Morgana more attack speed. As you can see, our puddles now have more time to do more damage. She's stunned, bro. I was like, no. Then we finally won. But alright, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Hopefully you learned something. Have a wonderful day. Peace.